Okay, so um, we're going to finish this chapter on um, kinematics in higher dimensions. And we'll do problems on Monday. And then I'll send out a quiz after we do problems. That'll be the second quiz, right? Uh, okay, so uh, we looked at projectile motion. We'll be doing a number of problems in those. And the next thing we need to look at as an example of kinematics outside of one dimension is uh, what we call uniform circular motion. I think I mentioned this before. So this is motion in a circle. <coughs> and the uniform means that it's constant speed. Okay, this is a really important case in physics. A lot of, a lot of times we, do, we deal with uniform circular motion. So we're going to look at it kinematically here. We're not, um, we're not into dynamics yet, right? So uh, we'll be able to get a much deeper picture when we look at it in dynamics. But right now, we just want to describe the motion and not worry about what's uh, causing the motion. Uh, incidentally, Galileo thought that um, you didn't need any force to do this. He thought the planets you know, orbiting the sun um, required no force, but we need, you need a force here, all right? And in fact, this has already come up. Um, so let me, before, I don't want to do that right now. Let's, it'll be, it'll come up in the example again. We're doing a quantitative example about this. So anyway, we're just using this, we just want to describe the motion mathematically here. So the speed is constant. The direction is continually changing. Is the acceleration zero? The speed is constant. Yeah, right. The acceleration is how the velocity changes, the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. And any way that you change the velocity, you're going to have a non-zero acceleration. If you change the speed, if you change the direction, yeah, this, this z derivative will not be zero. So there will be an acceleration here. And our goal right now is to determine that acceleration. That's going to be very useful, as we will see. So here's a situation at different, at just some arbitrary different times here. <coughs> the distance to the center of the circle is constant. This is of some body here, or a particle. And the speed, the magnitude of the velocity is constant. Now the textbook has, uh, what the textbook does is it writes down an equation, okay, or, or an expression for R of T. Um, choosing your origin here, which is a natural thing to do, you can write down what R, how R behaves this time. And it's, you know, it's a trigonometric thing, it involves sides and cosines. But, so that's an analytical way of, of getting at the acceleration because once you have this R of t, you can differentiate it once to find the velocity, v of t, from the position vector. Then you can differentiate it again to find the acceleration. So you can look at that approach if you want to. We're going to do it um, geometrically, straight from the definition. And here's the definition of the acceleration. It's the rate of change of velo velocity. And what we mean by that, what we mean by that is that it's the change in velocity over the change in time in the limit as delta t goes to zero. So this is, you know, it's the definition of the derivative, right? So here's, here's the situation. Let's look at uh, over some delta t that's kind of small here. The particle begins here. It's moving on this circular arc, right? It's moving like this. So here it is at one time. At some fairly short time later, it's going to be at some position up here. This is R1 at time T1. This is R2, which means at time T2. The, chain, the displacement between those two points, as we know, is the final value minus the initial value, right? And that occurs over some time, which is the time difference, the final time minus the initial time. All right. And you can see here that 
the instant, the velocity, which is the instantaneous velocity, at this point has to be tangent to the path. Remember that, as we discussed. So the, vo the velocity at this point is going to be tangent to the path here, and it'll have some magnitude. And it points, of course, the, we're assuming the particle's going this way, so it points that way. Similarly, there will be, here's the, Hold on. <clears throat> it's kind of not easy to see here. So remember, here's the circular arc here. So similar to this, the velocity will be tangent to the past. It'll be V2 here, which will have a different direction than V1, but the same magnitude. So <clears throat> what we care about, what we need to deal with here, is this change in velocity over the change in time. And then we'll, then we'll eventually take the limit. Okay, so what's the change in velocity? Well, the change in velocity over this interval is, of course, the final velocity minus the initial velocity. So I need to do some vector subtraction here. I'm going to um, parallel transport these vectors. I'm going to put them tail to tail because I'm doing a subtraction here. And the change in v is, is going to point from one head to the other head. And you know, it has to point in this direction because I know that delta V plus V1 has to be V2. So remember we talked about this? Previous chapter, vectors. So there's our delta V. <coughs> Question? All right, now, the next thing to notice here is that this is what we call an isosceles triangle. It has, it has two legs that are of equal length. But some, it's an isosceles, let's call an isosceles triangle. Two sides equal. This, is this an isosceles triangle? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Furthermore, look at this, over this delta t, there will be a delta theta here. You know, we take a s strobe photograph at one time or another time. This is going to be some, there'll be some elapsed time, and that'll correspond to a certain angle here. What's, that, what's the angle right here? Well, I, I gave it away, but can you see that when this line sweeps through this angle here, this is going to have to sweep through the same angle. And you can prove that. that sh it may be, I don't know, maybe may be obvious to you, but this has to be the same angle as that. And um, <clears throat> non-rigorously, the way to think it is about it, I think, is what I just said is, this sweeps through an angle here. This is going to have to sweep through the same angle. But you can prove it. If you just go in and do a, look at a little trigonometry here and look at these angles, you can prove that that has to be the same angle. So these are not just two any isosceles triangles. They're related to each other. How are they related to each other? Look at, look at this. If I scale this up, just magnify dimension in both directions, I, c I can get this. They're, we call that similar. They have the same shape. Does this bring back like high school memories? Okay. <laughs> okay. So we have two similar isosceles triangles. What that means is that one of the things it means is that if I take this length and divide it by that length, I've got to get this length divided by that length. Because this is just a, these are just scaled versions of each other. They have to scale like that. So we're essentially done. I write down this scaling law here because these are similar isosceles triangles. And then the acceleration that we're after is delta V over delta T. Let's substitute for delta V here. I've, ta I've brought the V over here, substituted that expression for delta V, brought out the const V and R are constants here, the speed and the distance. You know, the radius of the circle are constants. And what's this quantity right here? Well, it's just the velocity. So we end up with this not, I don't think it's obvious. We end up with the magnitude of the, we're looking at the magnitude here. The magnitude of the acceleration is V squared over R. All right, we're going to, you, you will, you won't forget this, uh, I don't think because we're going to use this so much in this course, okay? This is the magnitude of the acceleration for uniform circular motion. Now, we, um, oh, we've got to get the direction, but before that, let's just point something out here. When you're rounding a corner, 
Um, uniform circular motion is an approximate model, right? You're not going to necessarily be going at constant speed. My wife doesn't. She's a horrible driver. <laughs> she, she likes accelerates when she should be decelerating. I don't know. There's something, something going on there. But typically, uh, people will round a corner at constant speed, right? Do you feel that? Does that feel right to you? Yeah. But you know, it's, it's an approximation, right? So this is your acceleration. It's proportional to the square of the speed. It's that, uh, you know, one over r. So what that means is if you go faster, what's the acceleration? It, it's greater. And it climbs pretty quick. It climbs as it increases as the square of the velocity. And it's in a very rough qualitative sense, that's noticeable. If you speed up, you don't have to speed up that much to really feel. You feel the, uh, you feel the effect, right? In your frame of reference, you want to be pushed. You, you're, if, you're, if you're going this way, you feel like you're pushed that way. So we'll do a lot more on this when we get to dynamics, but I just want to point out now that we have this formula here. We should try to get something out of it. Here's something else that's interesting. What if I have a constant speed, but <clears throat> I, I round a corner with a larger and larger radius? So I go like this at a constant speed, and then I just imagine doubling the radius. What happens to the acceleration? Decrease. Yeah. It's, pardon me? That it mitigates the increase because I mean you're still increasing if you're keeping that speed is it's happening. At a the, st the speed is constant. Okay, so we, we do we round one corner and then we <coughs> double we double the radius, but I'm keeping the speed constant. Okay, so that's that's out of that's not in play here. So if I increase the, if I double the radius, I have the acceleration. So you don't feel as much acceleration. That has to be true. How do I know that? Well, let's, this is what, physicists do this a lot, and it's a really useful thing. We go to extremes. What if we, what if R is like infinite? So if I'm rounding a corner with an infinite race of curvature, what, what's, what's, what's my motion? Yeah, it's straight line. A circle of infinite radius is, is another way of looking at a straight line. What's the acceleration if you move with constant velocity on a straight line? Zero, Zero yeah. So this has got to be there. Something's got to be downstairs here, you know, and this is the simplest thing is just, you know, inversely proportional to R. Okay, now we're not done. We need to find the direction, but we already have that. <coughs> Look at the direction here, okay? So, oh, I, I, I didn't say this, but of course, we're, we're imagine shrinking this down, right? So as we shrink this down, let's say we bring, um, we can go either way. Let's say we, um, Let's keep R1 fixed, and let's make the, the time interval smaller and smaller. So R2 here is going to get closer and closer, right? This delta theta is going to go to zero. And when it goes to zero, you can see that delta V is going to be perpendicular to V1, right? And it's going to be pointing this way. So the answer is, for the direction, is that it points directly to the center. At this moment right here, we have this uniform circular motion. Yeah, that's not bad. This, this is the acceleration that points to the center. Over here, points to the center. Always points to the center. So this is so important that we've got a name for this. It's called the, this particular type of acceleration that occurs in uniform circular motion is called centripetal acceleration. We're not, no, that means center seeking. So the, the acceleration is not constant, is it? The, the magnitude is constant in uniform circular motion, but the direction is always changing, so it's not constant. And if we wanted to represent this analytically, we would have to, we would have to use I and the, we'd have to use some, it'd be kind of messy with I and J. So we can represent it with polar coordinates. So polar coordinates are, uh, Here's our, in the plane here, we've been dealing with rectangular or Cartesian coordinates to label some point here, right? But we can alternatively label the point, describe, you know, uniquely specify the point by some distance and some angle. Uh, we take the, I'll take the angle to be here. So those are called polar coordinates. 
And the nice thing about polar coordinates here is here's the unit r de ve e vector. It's the unit vector that's pointing straight out from the origin. Okay, so that's r hat. The theta unit vector has, has got to be perpendicular to it, and it's in the direction of increasing theta, so it points this way. As the particle moves around, these unit vectors change. So you want to you want to recognize something. It's not really important for this course, I don't think, but at higher levels it is. These unit vectors are not constant. They change their direction. So they track the particle. When the particle's over here, r hat's going to be that, that way, theta hat's going to be this way. But they offer us a nice way of writing down the centripetal acceleration. And here it is with a box around it, signifying that it's important. We can now put the direction in as minus r hat. Uh, okay, any questions so far? So we'll be, like I said, we'll be doing a lot of problems with this. Why do you have the negative there? Because remember, so r hat points straight out, and we need the vector that's pointing in, so we just put a minus sum. Now, um, I don't, the next thing that we're gonna, we're gonna, there's a little bit more to this, and I don't know, I can't remember how much we're gonna use in this course. It's not gonna be much, okay? So it's not a big deal, but um, we're here, we might as well generalize this a little bit. And it might, like I said, it might come up. What if the speed is not constant? Suppose you're still moving on a circle, but the speed is not constant. So that's not uniform circular motion, it's not uniform, okay? But what's the acceleration? Well, so you're moving, let's say you're moving around here, but it's not constant speed. Over, over a little bit of distance here, you're, there will be some accelerated acceleration pointing towards the center because you've changed direction. Because you've changed direction over that little arc here, there will be acceleration. And you can calculate that. And when you calculate it, you're going to get the same values we got before, v squared over r. Because the v has changed negligibly. What's more important there is the fact that it's changed direction. We're looking at the acceleration, this acceleration right here. But you pick up an additional component of the acceleration, clearly, which is right along here. If this, is, if this point is speeding up, okay, it's pass, as the particle passes this point here, and it's speeding up, it will have this component of the acceleration, which will be have magnitude v squared over r. And this way, it's going to have a component which is just dv dt, the speed. Yes? So as you speed up or slow down, does that mean that the acceleration at that instantaneous second that you slow down is not, I guess, perpendicular to your velocity? That's right. We have two components here. I think that's what you're saying. Let's, let's cut to the chase here. So here we are. Now, we're imagining this circle here, right? But we might as well generalize. Let's suppose we have an arbitrary path. So here we are in the plane. Okay. That looks kind of weird there. Now we can't, can't have any kinks. Remember that? That would require an infinite force. It's got to be a smooth. It's, it's got to be smooth. So pick a point. Now, this is not, I don't, I'm not crazy about this. Let's pick a point here. Okay. Over a small amount of time, what's the motion, what's the motion look like? You know, it's moving this way, right? It's changing direction. I can fit a circle here. Any smooth curve in two dimensions, or actually three dimensions, I can always go in there and find a unique circle that will match the motion over a, little, over a little time interval there. Very reasonable, right? So we're actually doing the general case here. This is absolutely general motion of a particle for it to, to descri kinematically describe its acceleration. We can see that, uh, and this is, I, we're, I think we're beyond the course right now, incidentally, so don't worry about this. But at this moment right here, there's going to be a, there'll be two components of the acceleration in general. There'll be one pointing towards the center of the circle, which you could get at, you know, if you 
got a computer programmed or, you know, to f do this fitting, right? There'll be a component pointing towards the center of this instantaneous circle right here. This circle's always going to be changing, right? It can be on the other side. There'll be a component pointing towards the center. And then, if it's speeding up or slowing down here, there will be a component tangent to that. So that's this component here. That's called the tangential acceleration. So, um, like I said, I don't know if we're not, if we do anything with this, it's not going to be much, okay? But it's just, it's nice to point it out here. So was there a question? Is there another question? Okay. Anybody, anybody have any questions about this? So we may do a little bit with it. Okay, so here's uh, an example. This is kind of like a quantitative demonstration. Sometimes, sometimes demonstrations become quantitative. So they're heading towards what we call an experiment. That's an experiment, okay? So this is one of those. Um, here's a heavy, this is a lead ball. It's heavy. And I'm going to tr do my best to try to get it to go in a, one possible motion here is uniform circular motion, right? So in other words, if I start with this here and give it just the right velocity, it's going to move in a circle. This is, and it's called, a, in this case, it's called a conical pendulum because you see the string here is tracing out a cone. Now that's not the general motion, right? Here's the general motion, and it's a little bit surprising. Whoa. What's going, it looks like an ellipse, right? Kind of, if you, if you take this weird kind of curve and maybe project it on this table, you'll, it looks like an ellipse. It's roughly an ellipse. But the ellipse is doing something, isn't it? What's it doing? Yeah, we have a name for that in physics. It's called uh, precessing. So the ellipse is, is rotating. It's slowly turning like this. This is complicated. Uh, it gets simple at smaller amplitudes. See if that's elliptical like that? Where's the precession? It's there, but it's just re really small. So in this, indeed, in fact, this is approximately ellipse down here, but it gets complicated at higher amplitudes. This is, this is a, we call a nonlinear effect at higher amplitudes. And nonlinearity can cause um, all kinds of weird things like chaos. So, um, one of the things that's interesting about this is, uh, you know, physics is a, we, we think of physics as a unified subject, that if you, you observe something in some system, it's probably going to be out there in some completely different system too. And physics is all tied together. And uh, believe it or not, uh, the planet Mercury under, undergoes a precession like this. Is anybody aware of this? Anybody ever heard of this? Yeah, now it's the, 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 the rotation, the precession is extremely slow. It's measured, it's, it's, a, it's measured in, um, it's, it's less than a degree per century. But it was measured several hundred years ago, I think. So if you're interested, there's a great video on this. Gene, how do they access the video? Okay, yeah, Gene and I made a video about this, okay? You guys can watch. Hey, is that one of the long ones? It is, isn't it? Yeah, and I know you guys, you know, six minutes is like twice as long as you can handle, right? You can maybe handle, <laughs> is that what they're saying now? Is it down to three now? But, uh, you know, it's, it's for you, you know, whatever you, whatever you want to get out of it. But, um, so let, let's do that, yeah. Do I need to write this down to remind you? I'm sorry, I'll, I'll have it. I'll okay, okay. Oh, okay, all right. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to we're going to do a calculation here. So I've, I've arranged this to be close to 60 centimeters. Let's see if it's still. Yeah, it's a little longer now. Maybe there's been some stretching, but it's it's close to 60 centimeters. It's not going to really matter. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick the uniform circular motion here when this is about 45 degrees. I'm just going to roughly estimate this. That corresponds to here. So if I give this the right speed, which is kind of like that, um, you can see, oh, you, <laughs> you see how when it comes back it's at a different point? It's not perfectly, do you see that? Like, you know, right now it was down here, it's up there, so that wasn't real good. 
but that may be the best I can do. And you remember, the 45 is just rough, right? Oh, this is wobbling. Yeah. What do you do about that? If this is a problem, what do you do? Anyone? Force it? Reinforce it. Yeah. How do you reinforce it? Yeah, that's one way. Or put another clamp, put a, put a, a, some, put a support here. Yeah, maybe another one there. Right. Okay, so let me, let's do this again. And what I'm going to do is we're going to time, we're going to find the period. And to do it, fair, to, if we just try to do one period, you know, if I try to do boom, boom, is this working? That's um, not real trustworthy, because there's going to be some error, start and stop error. But if we t do a lot of timing, you're going to encounter this in the lab, I think. If we do a lot of periods, it'll be more accurate. So let's do 10, OK? So let me see if I can get this thing going kind of right here. So that's one, two, So the period is what? We've got to divide this by 10. So what's the period? You tell me. Uh, can we get another? Let's get another. I think we can get another figure on this. Okay. Seconds. Let's put the units in there. Oh, what did we get before when we timed one? Yeah. Not, that's not trustworthy. This is a little bit more trustworthy. Okay. So this is the period. Um, now, for the purposes of the notes here, I just I shoved this value in, but we want to since we let's let's do our own calculation now with 1.31. It's you know it's a, le, a, a percent roughly difference, but here is the um, here's the circle that the thing's going in. You have to think about this a little bit, okay? At this moment, where is the acceleration pointing? To the center of the circle, which is where here. No, no, center, center of the circle is there, okay? So, um, so the acceleration at this moment is pointing here. Out here it's going to be pointing there. Uh, we found our period amazingly close to this. It's, hmm. So what's the radius? Well, there's a little bit of trigonometry here. You can see that it's the hypotenuse times the sine of 45. The sine of 45 is 1 over the square root of 2. So here's the radius to three figures. We'll do this to three figures, even though the third figure is not real significant. You know, my experience is this right here is probably accurate. I've done this a number of times. It's probably accurate to a plus or minus one, this digit here, or maybe two, something like that, roughly that. Okay, so this is R. What's the speed? Well, the speed is going to be the circumference divided by the period. So the circumference is 2 pi r. OK, I'm in SI units here. I'm not putting units, SI. So 2 pi times the radius. This is the radius divided by the period. We're going to have a 1 here. So what do we get for the speed? Can somebody tell me? It's going to be close to that. Nobody can tell me? Oh, so we just want to calculate this right this with a 1 here instead. That's all we, that's all we want to do. I guess it's early. <laughs> okay. Meters per second. <coughs> we have confirmation on that? Yes. Not that I don't trust you. <laughs> okay. Um, now it's less. Is that it's less? Why is it less? Period. Period's longer. Period's longer. So that's good. It's going in the right direction. All right. Now what's the acceleration? Well, it's going to be v squared over r. We've got v squared. We got r. We can calculate the acceleration. So what do we get for the acceleration? We're just going to put. 2.03 squared here.
It's not a trick calculation. Okay, well, it's not. Is that, we got somebody got 9.72? Doesn't matter. 9.72. Oh, 9.72. Well, I guess it's, it doesn't, it's not real critical, but. So, uh, because of that square, we're, you know, we were on, we were up here, 9.9, .9. yeah, so it dropped, you know, a couple percent because it's squared. It's a couple percent. We're, t we're talking about a percent roughly here, but because of that square, it comes up, it's more, it's a couple percent. Now, this is really close to 9.80, right? Do you think that's a coincidence? G, this is close to G, the free fall acceleration. No, they're, they're, they're very seldom do, are there coincidences. I mean extremely seldom. Something's going on here. <laughs> All right? It looks like that if we did this precisely, if we improved our experiment, I right? do this all the time you know, in the lab, if we improve this somehow, you know, you, can saw, you saw that it was floated. You know, when, it, when it passed here, it was at different points. It wasn't perfect. You know, it was definitely not you know, exact uniform circular motion. It, it's not unreasonable to think that we might get the acceleration due to gravity. So what's the, you know, what's the connection here? Well, there, gravity is involved here. Gravity is involved. And the reason it's involved is that, that there's a tension in the string here, and that depends upon gravity. So we'll, we'll revisit this problem once we get into dynamics. Dynamics will resolve this. It turns out that for this problem, with these precise, you know, precisely 45 degrees, precisely 60 centimeters, well, excuse me, for 45 degrees, it turns out that the acceleration is exactly g in this case. It just, it, that's, it is, it is, it is g in this case. And it's independent of the length. It doesn't matter what the length is. Hmm. Okay, so we'll do, we have to wait, we have to postpone that until dynamics. We'll do it. Uh, now, we actually talked about this last week. At this moment, let's say this is coming, um, this is going like this, this is coming out at you. We have to pick, you know, it could be going the other way, right? Let's suppose it's like in the demo here, it's coming right at, at this moment the velocity is here. If I cut the, we talked about this last week, if I cut the string, what's the motion? It's actually um, the answer, the, the strictly correct answer is, the motion is a parabola, becomes projectile, becomes projectile motion, right? This thing, going around like this, if I cut the string right here, it's gonna go like that. It's, you know, it's projectile motion with an initial velocity that's horizontal. Okay. Uh, okay, so we just have to wait till we do dynamics. Any questions about that? Uh, okay, now, um, I want to introduce a, a concept to you here, and I'll tell you right now, it's not, you know, for this course, it's not a big deal, and in fact, we're going to omit, it has to do with what's called relative motion, where we have different frames of reference. So I have a person in one frame of reference here who's doing measurements and everything, and then another person moving by here at constant velocity, u, and looks at the same system, looks at a body. That person's gonna make different measurements. And it's not obvious, but it turns out the, the relationship between these measurements is, is important. And um, one of the reasons that it's important is this led Einstein and early 1900s to recognize that what we're about to say here is wrong. That when you get to velocities comparable to the speed of light, what we're about to do here, which seems obviously true, as you'll see, it's, not, it's actually not correct. And that led, that led, I'm teaching a course on this right now, modern physics course, um, that led to the discovery of what's called the most important, uh, the what do they call it? The most famous equation? What is the most famous equation? And you didn't have to think about it, right? 
Yeah, so Einstein's study of this, which seems kind of, you know, so who cares, led directly to E is equal to mc squared. And if you're interested in this, you need, to, you need to take a course in modern physics. Modern physics has relativity, that's what Einstein called the theory, special theory of relativity, and there was a general theory of relativity to include gravitation. Um, modern physics has that in it and quantum mechanics. You've all heard of quantum mechanics, right? We can't live without it, all your mobile devices, oh, it's all, all microelectronics. To understand you know, how people do that, with my, what they do with microelectronics is quantum mechanics. So I don't think you guys take modern physics, but you could if you want to. I, don't you have some freedom here? No? <laughs> okay, so anyway. Um, Right. Now, I want to get back to what I was going to say. We're going to do the one-dimensional case just to get the idea in your head, to get you thinking about this a little bit. And we'll do, we, we may do something with, with it later on in the course. Um, I can't remember. But we're going to skip higher dimensions, okay? So it's, whenever you see this, this means omit. Or it can be omitted. You omit it, right? You know, <laughs> okay. So, uh, it gets a little, it gets more complicated, and I've just found the hard way years ago that uh, it's better for us to, to, in this course, to skip it, okay? But if you're interested in it, you can look at it, okay? So we're gonna do it in one dimension here. So let's go to one dimension. So what do we mean? What's, what's going on here? Well, again, it's this, we're just looking at these two so-called frames of reference here. So this one, um, this picture holds in this person's frame of reference. So this, this person is moving at velocity u, constant velocity u, this way. And at time t is equal to zero, what's the, where, are these, where are these observers? You can see that at time t is equal to zero, the origins coincide. That's a common thing that people use just to simplify the math. You don't have to, it just simplifies things. So at time t is equal to zero, the moving, and this is universally called the primed observer. This is notation that everyone uses around the world. This is the unprimed. Okay. Uh, you know, people need words. I think we might have talked about this, or it might have been my other class. We need words to describe things, okay? So this is called the primed reference frame. This person measures a body at a certain distance here. We're all in one dimension here. And it's going to be called X prime. So this is the prime frame. In this frame, where there's no prime, it's called the unprime frame, or also called the laboratory frame. This person's going to measure this distance as x, right? So they have different coordinates that they ascribe to the, this particle. It's going to change as, as time goes on. This body could be accelerating, right? But it's obvious here that there's a simple relationship between x and x prime. And you can see it right here, can't you? What's x? It's going to be ut plus x prime. So we just found the transformation equation that tells us how to transform velocity, well, position, between how these people, you know, we can go from one frame to the other. So again, use the velocity of this frame relative to this frame of reference. V is the instantaneous velocity in the laboratory frame. V prime will be in the prime frame. And we, we know what, how to relate those velocities because all we do is we take, I didn't even make an, an inset equation. <laughs> We take this obvious fact here that x is equal to x prime plus ut, and we differentiate it with respect to time, and we find this. So this is, this is really simple. It's deceptively simple, as I'll explain in a minute. But here's um, a simple example. If, if this is, uh, let's say, a, a railroad car that's moving with some speed u, and here's somebody on the side of the tracks over here, right, motionless. This person's in this frame. And this person throws a baseball at, uh, I don't know, let's say 50 miles per hour. And the train is moving. Let's, we don't, let's not even write this down. The train is moving at, uh, let's say, 20 miles per hour. What do I see the velocity of that particle as? 70. 70, right. I'm going to see, I'm going to say that it's moving 70 miles per hour. It's obvious, and nobody ever questioned it until Einstein came along. 
All right? And now we know that this is just an approximation. It's not exactly right. Now, the actual speed will deviate from this by a, such a small amount, it's impossible to measure. But once one, one, of, one or both of these velocities becomes comparable to the speed of light, this simple relationship here breaks down. It breaks down a lot. So has anyone ever taken special relativity? Anyone ever had any? Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, we, and I, I, we don't want to get into it right now because I, I can spend forever talking about it. But anyway, I just want to point out what's really interesting about this is that, it is, is that it's not exactly true. And so the reason, it, I sh the reason it's not exactly true is there's an upper speed limit in the universe and it's the speed of light. You cannot exceed that. In fact, any, any object that has mass, if, to accelerate it to the speed of light requires an infinite amount of energy. So you could put all the energy in the universe into some particle and it, w it won't be moving the speed of light. So that was a, caused a revolution in how we thought about things with relativity. That, that was, the paper came out, it's really two papers on special relativity, came out in 1905. That was Einstein's miracle year. Do you guys watch documentaries? No. Yeah, so the miracle year, he published four papers and finished his dissertation. He got the Nobel Prize for one of the papers, but not relativity. Even by the early 19, here I am going on, even by in the <laughs> early 1920s when he got the Nobel Prize, um, people just still didn't buy into relativity. So the Nobel com Committee gave it to him for the discovery of the photoelectric effect. This is a quantum mechanical effect. And, and, then, and for other contributions in theoretical physics. They didn't mention relativity. Amazing. Oh, so there was two papers on relativity. One was involving this, and then one took this and applied it, and he came up with E is equal to mc squared. That was the other paper. And then he did two other papers, and one of them got the Nobel Prize. So that's the, what they call the miracle year, right? <laughs> Which is you know, aptly named. Okay, now um, I wanted to show a demonstration where this is a top view of a demonstration where there's a platform here. Uh, sometimes I just use a bookshelf and I push it along at some speed and then there's a toy car here, battery powered toy car that once you switch it on, it moves with constant velocity with respect to whatever surface it's on, okay? And the, 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 the cars are gone. They seem to have disappeared. So, you know, several possibilities are there. One of them is somebody wanted to give their kids some, you know, toy cars <laughs> or something, I don't know. Or somebody just, you know, took it and never returned it. So I'm trying to track it down. Try, there's, we have two of them. It's, it's black, who said that? It's black, it's actually not a car, it's more like a, I don't know what it is, but it's all black, and they're about this big. And it's got, it actually has a tread. It, it, so it looks like a, kind of looks like a tank, <laughs> but with no turret, I, I don't know. Well, anyway, so, um, so let's, so we can't do the demo, but we can, uh, it, I don't think you really, you know, it's just basically this idea right here. So let's do a problem here. Let's say we have this platform, this is the demo, okay, and we'll make it quantitative here. You're looking, remember, top view. Let's say the platform's moving at three centimeters per second, you know, kind of a low speed, right? And let's say that the, the, the battery-powered car, relative to the surface that it's on, it's, you know, it's moving these wheels that has these treads on there at a constant speed. So let's say that's two centimeters per second. So what do I see in the laboratory frame out here? Well, it's just like this, right? We're going to add these two. So I'm going to see five centimeters per second, right? To an extremely good approximation, right? But it's not exact. What if we flip, the next thing to do is to flip one of these, and we can flip either one. In this diagram here, I'm, I'm now moving the platform this way. Now what do I see outside here in the laboratory frame? Even though in this frame of reference, the car is going in, in this direction, what do I see out here? 
I see it moving this way. Right? There's no problem. In fact, what if both of these were the same magnitude? What if this, what if this were two centimeters per second? If the car is going two centimeters per second in that frame, and then I, it'll be motionless in my frame. Yeah, so that's a nice demonstration, but somebody took the cars. Okay, so this has, uh, this is half of a classic problem here. You guys ever heard of this problem? There's a river and you have two swimmers. Oh, good, somebody has, Gary has, okay. You have, there's a river flowing this way. You have two swimmers here. They both go the same distance. One goes across the river and comes back, straight across, comes back. They start off at the same time. One goes down the river by the same width as the river, same distance, and comes back. Which one gets there first? So how many people, one, at least one person has heard of this problem? That's it? Yeah, my modern, uh, this is a classic problem in modern physics because, uh, I can't talk about it, because it led to the discovery, Michelson's discovery of the interferometer to try to measure the speed of the Earth through the luminous, luminiferous ether. And everybody knows Michelson, right? Yeah. Right, because he was at the Naval Academy for a while. Uh, so we're just going to do half of the problem. We're going to look at, in this case it's a boat, going downstream, turning around, and going upstream, okay? If you want to look at the whole problem, you need to look at that section we're going to omit. And I probably have it as a problem in here. Yep, there it is. It's boats instead of rivers. So they're both going the same, uh, you know, which one? It's an interesting problem. And if, you're, if you get interested in it, you can come by and talk to me if you want to. So, what we're going to do is just half of it. We're going to do this problem right here. Now, there's immediately a problem here. We're going to call, we're going to say that the river here has velocity u relative to the bank, all right? And we're going to say that the boat, what's important to the boat is its speed relative to the water. We're going to call that v0. What if u is greater than v0? What if the speed of the river here is greater than the speed that the boat can travel relative to the water? What's going to happen when the boat turns around and tries to come back? It's going to be like that. It's going to be like this. Yeah, it's um, it's not going to be able to make it back. So we assume we're going to assume here that the speed of the boat relative to the water is greater than the speed of the water, so it can make it back upstream. Now, first, as physicists, we look at the simplest case first, which is u is equal to zero. So and that's useful. So if there's no, if, if the river is not flowing, okay, then this becomes easy. The speed of the boat, I see it as v0, and the total distance is 2L, and the time is the total distance divided by the velocity. Because the velocity is the distance divided by the time, right? Velocity is distance divided by time, and I've just solved that in my head for the time here, and I get the distance divided by the velocity. So that's, we're going to call that t0, that's when u is equal to 0. Now, when the boat's going in the direction of the current, it's moving faster due to the current. When it's coming back, it's moving slower, right? So there's competition there. Do they exactly cancel? Is the solution to this problem, the time it takes to the boat going like this, is it going to be the same as this? Now, it can't be. And the reason it can't be is, we know that as we imagine, we go to an extreme case here, as we imagine this getting greater and greater, what's eventually going to happen? The boat can't make it back, which means we get an infinite value of the time here. So that's a very strong indication that we're not going to get perfect cancellation here, and in fact, the time's going to be less than t0. So let's see what it is. We can calculate it. We split the motion into two segments. There's the downstream part. Downstream, on the bank here, I see the velocity is this, just like the toy car thing, right? So the time it takes to go down the river is going to be the distance L divided by the velocity, which is that. The time it takes to go up, now the velocity is reduced, again, just like the toy car. So this is the time to go up. I add the times. I have these two expressions. I put them under a common denominator. Now this may be throwing some of you, but if you multiply this term by v naught minus u divided by v naught minus u, which is just, I'm just multiplying it by one, and this by plus, I get the difference of squares here. This is just algebra, okay? So I'm just, I'm bringing this under a common denominator. 
Now, <clears throat> for no flow, oh, let's, so what do we do with this? Here's our answer. First thing we do is we got to check. What, how do we, what's our first check? U equals zero, obviously. So, but you need, you know, you need to get used to thinking like this. So maybe it's not so obvious. So I know what the answer should be when u is equal to zero, and I better get that answer here, do I? Yep. If I kill the u and cancel one of the v-naughts, I get that. So that checks in that case. Uh, there's some other checks. We, ex we strongly expect that t should be greater than t-naught. Is this, um, is this greater than t-naught? Yeah, once you add some u in here, once u is not zero, you're going to get a you're going to get the denominator gets decreased so the value goes up so t is in fact greater than t0 as we suspected so that's the kind of a check you know, we we naturally expected that and the formula shows that oh finally look at this what happens is i make v0 what happens if i reduce v0 so that it goes down to u what does our formula tell us when v0 equals u infinite is that right? When v0 is equal to u, we're going to get 0 down here and not 0 up there. It's infinite. Is that right? Yeah, that's when the boat is just going to be stationary. It's never going to make it back. So it checks out in those cases. Uh, okay, so like I said, we may do a little bit with that. I can't remember. But it's just, it's, you can see that it's, it's interesting, even though it looks boring. That's, this is where e is, believe it or not, this is where e is equal to mc squared comes from. Okay.